it's one o'clock, so I'm going to call the uh, meeting to order. And the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of announcements to make as follow up items from previous meetings. The first one is that we will be posting Certificate of Need Bulletin 004, which is the adjustments to Certificate of Need monetary jurisdictional thresholds um, later today, and it may already have been posted. Um, and you recently voted to raise those thresholds. So that is the updated document for CON. Second, I wanted to uh, let folks know that last Friday, I received a response to the request that you all made uh, through me to AHS and DIVA um, for them to share any information that they had on the availability of Medicaid rate increases or potential one-time state funding to help address the mid-year commercial rate increases that, we, that are before us, that have been before us and are before us. I did just want to make um, a, a just read a, a few bullets from the letter as a summary, um, and Patrick also will have that in his slide presentation. Um, so, and and thank you to Secretary Samuelson and her team for the response. Uh, she says, speaking directly to the board's interest in whether Medicaid can increase its rate to offset the mid-year rate adjustments as requested. I emphasize the following three points. One, the state is required to manage spending within a budget neutrality cap for its global commitment to health 1115 demonstration waiver. The budget neutrality cap is a primary concern when considering any new investment or adjustment to Medicaid rates, particularly as AHS is actively negotiating the terms of renewal for Vermont's waiver. I do not anticipate final terms prior to June 2022. Second, the Department of Vermont Health Access has already increased Medicaid payments for services offered by hospitals in 2022 and provides disproportionate share hospitals payments to address a portion of the shortfall that hospitals experience from government payment rates. And third, DIVA is leading the way in the transition to value-based payments through providing fixed perspective payments for hospitals. This creates a predictable and stable revenue stream when service patterns are disrupted as evidenced by COVID-19. And the last paragraph um, I will read aloud because I think it summarizes the letter well. To this end, I encourage the GMCB to carefully consider the proposals from the hospitals for mid-year adjustments, particularly in light of the available FEMA funding and extensive support that has been provided by state and federal funding mechanisms, and weigh the need for short-term stabilization versus long-term sustainability. That letter is posted on our website under what's new, and I encourage um, the public to read the entire letter of course, the board has seen that um, when it came in last Friday. And then I will um, also just remind folks, as I have for the last year and a half or so, that we are uh, accepting uh, public comments related to the next potential model with CMMI. We share those comments with our uh, partners at AHS and the governor's office. Uh, so that they can see them and be made aware of them as they are leading the negotiations for the next model. And I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 30th. Is there a motion? I moved. I unmuted. Everything else. So I don't do motion. I don't do minutes. <laughs> I will move approval of the minutes, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Jessica. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, it's been moved and uh, seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 30th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion um, 
carried unanimously. Before we uh, start this afternoon's uh, uh, meeting and get into uh, the discussion on UVM, I did wish to make a public announcement at this time. And that is after um, months and months of soul searching, I have announced that I am retiring on July 9th. And um, it's been an incredible experience working with almost everyone on this call over the last five years in this particular role. And um, where the years went, I'm not really sure. I uh, started in public service in 1981, getting elected to the Board of Aldermen in the city of Rutland and have uh, held so many different positions at the local and state level that uh, it's it's going to be unique to have some time just to spend on family and travel and um, doing some things that uh, I've always wanted to do. So um, if anybody knows a, a great uh, candidate for uh, chair of the board, um, it will be the normal process and uh, names can be submitted. They will go through the nominating committee and the governor will choose the next chair. So with that, I'm going to Mr. turn chair, the meeting over. Mr. Yes. Chair, we're, we're going to, this is Mike Fisher. At some point, we're going to need a public comment period on this announcement. So I just, just want to go on record saying that. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to give you that opportunity, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Rooney. And Patrick, whenever you're ready. So Mike Fisher, the only thing more difficult than a public comment period is the fact that I have to follow that announcement with some sort of uh, professional presentation here, but I'm going to give it a shot. <clears throat> uh, I want to make sure Kim Sears is on and that she can hear me. I can. Thank you very much. Great. OK, we'll get right in. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you see the presentation? I can. All right, so I am assuming everyone at home can see it as well. So we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, board members, members of the public and stakeholders. We're here this afternoon to uh, discuss the mid-year budget modification requests of the University of Vermont Medical Center and Central Vermont Medical Center. We have received some public comments on this particular topic uh, in part or in total related to UVM and Central Vermont. Uh, and our staff did a great job of breaking down some of the contents of those uh, public comments that were received by the board. You can see here 58 in total. Uh, and then we acknowledge some of the uh, common themes that existed throughout those public comments. Uh, and so, uh, the ones that gave us permission to share are located on the Green Mountain Care Board website, uh, but all of these have been shared with the board members themselves, even if uh, we were not given the authority by the uh, commenter to produce those on a public setting. So <clears throat> we have 57 uh, in total on this page, and as uh, Executive Director Barrett alluded to, we did receive an additional one from the Agency of Human Services, and we've posted uh, portion of that response that she spoke to here. Uh, the totality of that letter can also be viewed on the Green Mountain Care Board website. Uh, and I'm not going to reiterate what Executive Director Barrett stated, uh, but we have the synopsis of some of those points here on slide three. <clears throat> Again, covering as we did with the Rutland Regional Medical Center's request, some of the budget performance review and adjustment uh, factors that the board shall consider just to level set. Uh, it's been a while since we uh, went through this with Rutland. Uh, so providing that here for public transparency purposes and as a uh, recapture for the board as they consider the two mid-year requests that are upon us today. We wanted to start by highlighting uh, the UVM Medical Center's history here, um, history of change in charges and history of commercial effective rate, uh, what they submitted, what they what were they were approved for, and some of the uh, differential. Uh, we went through on the gross charge level and calculated the NPR value of those cuts. That would be the left-hand graph here. Uh, and in to total over the years that are exhibited here, 2017 to 2022, uh, the total NPR value of those rate reductions has been a little over $17 million. 
um, and the values are derived from the submissions outlining the dollar value of 1% of the request. That's something we ask each hospital every budget cycle to provide for us. And so the differentials there uh, equate to about 17 million in aggregate for NPR for the medical center on the whole. A different perspective of that, looking at uh, the NPR effect here, <clears throat> uh, we can see that the history here is that the, the medical center had a few years from 17 to 19 where uh, their budgets were approved uh, lower than submitted or at submitted and the medical center actually outperformed their budget. Some years it was more significant than other, uh, but that is the three years leading up to the pandemic and we're level setting here, so we're we're showing that uh, the years of the pandemic have not been very kind from a net revenue perspective uh, to an organization that was at least meeting and sometimes exceeding its approved budgets in the past years. And of course, uh, 2022 here does not have a column for that. It's a, it's a bit early to uh, provide a projection. There is some of that data built into this as well. This was more about the historical perspective here about where uh, UVMMC has lined up over these several years leading up to and through the pandemic. So the request, we received the request on March 18th. Uh, the reasons cited were unanticipated demand for services, adverse effect of payer mix and workforce challenges in recruiting and maintaining staff. These are themes that are common to, uh, in part to the Rutland uh, presentation that we heard. These challenges have, been, have, have an adverse <clears throat> excuse me, effect on operating expenses uh, that are projecting to exceed the 22 budget by nearly 93.3 million and 7 million respectively for UVMMC and CVMC. And margin erosion has been a factor due to those items cited above. Uh, UVM and CVMC also noted that they continue to experience higher than nor normal inpatient needs as well as patients presenting with higher acuity conditions due to delayed care from the pandemic. They also continue to have difficulty discharging patients to lower acuity beds or psychiatric care, also known as appropriate levels of care due to insufficient numbers of available skilled nursing facilities and psychiatric beds in the community. <clears throat> UVM's financial update, the reason uh, that they brought their request to us is the decrease in volumes, higher margin services, increasing average length of stay, cost inflation, growing traveler FTEs, uh, cost per FTE as well, uh, have contributed to their net patient fixed perspective payments falling by 74 million or 4.9%. Other operating revenues are 36% over budget, unbudgeted federal relief accounting for some of that, and also the receipt and acknowledgement of uh, cybersecurity insurance payment in the amount of $30 million, which are aiding and offsetting a portion of the rising costs and constraining further margin erosion. The operating expenses driven by workforce pressures and rising costs are projected at 5.6% over budget, uh, which equates to about $93.2 million. The result is an operating margin that's currently projected to be negative $39 million or a 2.2% loss on margin and a $90 million variance from what they had budgeted. Central Vermont has many common themes uh, with the medical center in Burlington, decreasing volumes, higher margin services, increasing average length of stay, cost inflation and growing travelers and cost per FTE uh, have contributed to the net patient revenue falling by 7.7 .7 million and missing by 3.1%. <clears throat> Other operating revenues of 40% over budget due in part to some of the unbudgeted federal relief, uh, which is aiding and offsetting a portion of the rising costs and constraining further margin erosion. Operating expenses driven by workforce pressures and rising costs are projected at 2.6% over the approved budget. The result, however, is a margin that's currently projected at a loss of 4.9 million or a negative 1.8% loss on margin and a $7.6 million variance from budget. So some high level uh, financial updates there working through the income statement <clears throat> as to why we're here to discuss UVM's request. The request itself, both hospitals are looking for 10% uh, change in charge uh, to gross charges uh, from the 6.05% and 6% that were approved in September of 2021. The new rate uh, they have requested be effective April 1st. Now, a brief recap here of what the impact would do to their net patient and fixed perspective patient revenues of each hospital, as you can see here. Both hospitals, as just discussed, are projected to miss their approved NPR FPP figures. And the projection with the mid-year rate request 
uh, we'll only claw back a portion of that uh, revenue gap. And we'll get, we're going to discuss that in more detail uh, later on as we work towards a recommendation. The financial impact of this, uh, the net patient revenue impact is about $28 million over the current projection. Again, clawing back some of that revenue gap that they're currently projected to experience. Uh, this is mostly to be recaptured in outpatient services. Again, we'll talk more about this uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, if approved net patient revenues, are still projected to be under budget by about 46 million. If approved, the operating margin is estimated to be a loss of 12 million or a 0.07% loss on margin and a $64 million variance from budget. So some uh, mitigation to the margin situation that they're projecting as of right now, <clears throat> lowering it from 39 to 12 million. CVMC's financial impact, if approved, net patient revenue is an increase of four and a half million over the current projection, mostly recaptured in inpatient services. If approved, the net patient fixed perspective payment revenues are still projected to be under budget by 3.2 million. And if approved, the projected operating margin uh, will fall to a $690,000 loss or a 0.2% loss on margin and a variance of budget of $3.4 million. So capturing some of that in a uh, compacted income statement here. Uh, we can see the situation through Q1 uh, as just as uh, <clears throat> provided by the UVM Medical Center and the UVM Health Network. And we can see that the year to date, that first quarter was about a $23 million loss. Uh, the year, the projection for the year uh, being about 39.2. And then also some uh, negative experience happening below that operating line uh, in non operating revenue. Uh, which would compound the loss from the net operating income to the total margin, as we call it, or excess of revenue <clears throat> over expenses at 51 million. Uh, whereas through the first quarter, there was some positive uh, activity uh, in the investment portfolio that was offsetting some of those operating losses. <clears throat> Looking at the modification here, the projection, the projection with the rate increase and some of the variances that exist in that space. You can see here, if your eye is drawn on slide 13 to the net operating income line, there is that $39 million loss that is being projected. And the mitigating effect of the request that UVM has made would be that that margin shrinks to a, just under a $13 million loss. Uh, however, the real story here is the variance from budget uh, for the projection and the projection for rate increase. Uh, UVM had originally budgeted a $51.5 million uh, operating surplus uh, that is not materializing and will not materialize unless something significant occurs between now and the end of the year, uh, in addition to any uh, regulatory rate impact that this board may approve. Uh, so it would have to be a significant turnaround uh, for the hospital to achieve its budgeted expectations. And that goes for not just the operating margin, but also the total margin uh, with the activity that is expected <clears throat> in the stock market, according to uh, UVMMC, based on some of their investment portfolio activity. So all in all, this rate effect would not bring them whole uh, at a break even. Uh, they would still be operating at a loss uh, for fiscal year 2022. Moving to central Vermont, uh, again, similar story here. Um, the difference here is that what was provided to us through first quarter was that this hospital was operating at a break even. Um, their budget, however, had them operating at nearly a $600,000 loss through Q1, uh, but their overall budget for the year was about a $2.7 million operating surplus. What we're seeing with the projection is that currently, as things stand, if nothing is done, that loss will sink to about $5 million uh, for the remainder of the year. Um, and of course, some of the uh, activity that they're expecting in their projection in the market, uh, not having much of a mitigating effect at all, with the total margin sinking to over a $6 million mm -hmm. loss. Whereas through the first quarter, uh, they were reporting some gains on their investments that were bringing that total margin into positive territory. Uh, so very different from the budgeted, ex budgeted experience uh, that they brought before the board back in July and August and that the board deliberated on, uh, which again, just highlighting why we're here to have this discussion today. 
a similar look to the UVM Medical Center here, providing the budget, the projection, the projection with rate increase so that the board and folks following at home can see the impact that this request is going to have, especially on some of those bottom line figures. And as I stated, we'll get more into the net patient revenue impact as we work towards our recommendation. Um, but very, very uh, significant uh, losses here being projected by this organization. However, as we'll see in the next couple of slides, they're not out of uh, the history of central Vermont. So they do fall in line, even though they are significant and the reasons for them are, are, are affecting all hospitals. Uh, the losses for this specific, uh, specific hospital uh, is in line with some of the historical performances that it has had, uh, just to be clear. So <clears throat> again, providing some of those variances here, a very different story from what they had budgeted to what their reality is and what they're projecting their reality to be as they work through fiscal year 2022. So getting into some of that historical perspective, uh, you'll note that this is a version that we have provided year in and year out showing actual versus budget and the change between the two. Uh, you can see here that uh, UVM has struggled over the last couple of years, as I alluded to, to meet their budgets, uh, COVID being one of the primary causes. Uh, however, some of the items we discussed in our fiscal year end report about a year ago, also being the Fannie Allen difficulties that they've experienced and the cyber attack in 2021, contributing to those missed budgets as well. And again, this year we have uh, another set of unique circumstances that uh, is impacting uh, the UVM Medical Center. And it appears that once again, uh, they will be missing their budget here for uh, net patient revenue. So at the top, it's where things currently stand with the projection. And at the bottom, you can see the orange column there is the only element of change here. And that is the impact of what this rate request would do to that NPR. So <clears throat> looking at that in comparison to the history, uh, you can see that this is an organization, as I discussed before, um, met or exceeded its budget in three years leading up to the pandemic. And since that time has had a hard time uh, getting back to that uh, level of uh, net revenue generating activity uh, that it once had in comparison to its budget. The same look being provided here for Central Vermont Medical Center over the same period. Um, this is again is the hospital that uh, you can see from top to bottom here uh, showing the net revenue impact of this rate increase. It's about four and a half million dollars, uh, but it's still not going to get the hospital to budget. Now uh, the difference here is this is a hospital that has struggled to hit its budgeted marks over the years that we have here in review uh, and of course 2021 even with the uh, rate adjustment uh, is still going to keep in line with some of those historical budget misses uh, that being said 2017 being the only year that uh, the organization has exceeded its budget uh, during this uh, six-year look back look at some of the statistics here for uvm i'll first note that on the far side of this uh, we did not ask for an age of plant projection uh, for th these individual hospitals so that's missing that is the reason why we see that nose dive there it's not because they've made major improvements uh, to their assets it is because that's not something that we asked for however we did want to build in uh, the day's cash on hand projection that they provided us so that we could align that with some of the history here. Um, <clears throat> we can see that oh, for the most part, uh, UVM's days cash have been in excess of 190 days. There's a slight dip in 2019, uh, but following that, you can also see a dip in uh, average age of plant. UVM made some significant investments uh, in infrastructure in 2019, which did dip into some of their cash reserves. Uh, but then you can see that average age of plant uh, falling uh, the following year as those assets were brought online. Um, <clears throat> Central Vermont, on the other hand, with several years of losses that we'll get into, uh, has had a little bit more of a difficult time with days cash on hand. Uh, they do have a spike in 2020, as you can see, as did uh, UVM. Most of that related to uh, some of the federal relief that was coming in at that time. Uh, to help bolster the position of these organizations and others like it throughout the state and the country as they combated the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but those lot, those days cash have been whittled away through some of the reclamation that has occurred that we've discussed, 
uh, but also ongoing losses are taking their effect as well on that day's cash on hand. But we wanted to provide an update to that projection as UVM provided to us, so we could align that with the history of days cash on hand for these two hospitals. Looking over the history of operating margins, um, very different stories for each of these hospitals. Uh, the University of Mount Medical Center produced some very generous margins back in the 2016 and 2017 and 2018, uh, but we have seen those erode. Uh, and really up until this year, the bottoming out point <clears throat> uh, really was 2020. Uh, they took some pretty significant financial stresses during the pandemic, uh, which caused that. Um, 2021, as uh, we discussed in our fiscal year end, is largely bolstered by federal relief money that was uh, received in 2021 and recognized <clears throat> to produce that operating margin. Uh, as we discussed about a month ago, that is not, along with several of the operating margins in the state, a margin that you would consider organically derived from operations. That is being bolstered by uh, an immense amount of federal relief money that's helping keeping the system afloat. So it's no different for uh, the University of Mont Medical Center in that regard for 2021. And then we built in the projection and the projection with rate increase, which we've already discussed. Uh, so again, you can see that getting back to break even as things currently stand, even with the 10% the request on top of what they received in September is not going to get them back to whole. Uh, the story with Central Vermont is significantly different. Uh, they have a history now that is beginning to stretch back of some significant operating losses. And as we've said before, um, if this hospital were a standalone institution, and it were not under uh, the health network, we would have a lot more concerns about the operating performance of this organization. Uh, but similar to the medical center as it relates to the projection for 22 and the projection 22 increase, uh, still not getting back to whole uh, and, and to a break even status. But as I alluded to, you can see that that projected uh, $4.9 million loss is not necessarily out of the ballpark of this hospital's recent history. Um, so it does fit in with 2019, uh, but is an improvement over the low point of 2018. Uh, but there was some uh, there was some progress being made here, and we should account for that too, that from 2018 to 2020, uh, this hospital was able to begin to shrink some of those losses. And 2021 uh, proved difficult, and they took a step back, and now we have uh, the uh, unanticipated consequences of the current environment uh, wreaking havoc again on the operating performance of the hospital. <clears throat> Another perspective that you saw uh, as it related to Rutland here around Central Vermont and UVMC's, or, excuse me, UVMC and Central Vermont's five year average. You can see uh, average change in charge and median. Uh, these hospitals are operating at the lower to middle end of that over the last five years. Uh, so we have the 3.5% <clears throat> average for uh, Central Vermont and UVM, uh, respectively. And then over on the other side of the median, we have 3% for Central Vermont and UVM. So both of them have been paired pretty closely over the last five years. Looking at that five-year history and what that five-year history would be with the 10% adjustment, we can see that, again, the five-year average has been 3.5% median at three. Uh, if this 10% were to be approved, the five-year average would move to 5.51 and 5.5 respectively. The median does not move. However, this does put them up at the top, uh, near the top of the uh, 14 hospitals in Vermont for highest five-year uh, average uh, if this were to be approved. Another perspective similar to Rutland is we took their first quarter financial results, uh, compared them to the first quarter results of the other six or the other four, excuse me, uh, Vermont PPS hospitals. So the Vermont PPS first quarter results compared to UVM and CVMC. And then as we did in the budgets last year, uh, comparing them to their uh, counterparts in Northern New England and the Northeast as far as geographical footprint is concerned. And so we can see that through first quarter, and it's important to note, this is a point in time. Those uh, those comparisons for 2019 are full years. 
in which their first quarter could have potentially re resembled some of the activity we're seeing here in 2019, but throughout the year, uh, changes were made uh, by leadership or performance turned around naturally, and they ended up in a certain position. But it's important to recognize this is just a snapshot to show you where they would be should their year end today or as, as of first quarter <clears throat> across a few of these high level uh, financial measurements here. And so we wanted to provide you with that perspective as well for these two hospitals. Uh, a couple items of note, um, historically, the days payable and days receivable for these two organizations in the interperiod reporting that they do to us always come in very high. And throughout the year, those numbers begin to fall. I am not entirely sure why that is. It is only related to, uh, I believe, these two hospitals and maybe Porter. Uh, so take that with a grain of salt. I can tell you uh, year over year, their days payable and days receivable are right there with their medians or they outperform their medians. Uh, so interperiod look, maybe not the best for days payable and days receivable, admittedly. A few follow up questions that we had kind of boilerplate questions to uh, UVMSC and CVMC uh, around third party payer contracts and whether or not they had reached out to them in advance of this request. And the answer was no, not as of March 18th, 2022. Uh, we did ask as we did with Rutland around the contingency plan if this is not received. Uh, UVM responded, we'll use the same process for this mid-year adjustment that we use to allocate our approved annual budgeted rate increase. We'll examine all codes, looking for opportunities to standardize around a consistent multiplier compared to Medicare, opportunities to bring various commercial rates more in line with each other and where the rates compared to market should be adjusted. As stated above, yes, if this mid-year adjustment is not approved, we'll need to scale back service, which will impact wait times. Getting back to some of the other questions that we had, uh, we did want to know about specific financial covenant triggers as it relates to bond covenants. And <clears throat> as we discussed last week, or as Mr. Gobe and Mr. Vincent discussed, I should say, uh, it's the network uh, that carries the debt service cov coverage ratio. And board member Holmes wanted to know how each hospital in the network uh, contributes to that effort. And you can see here at the bottom, the results from UVM are that the medical center, no surprise, carries uh, the predominant uh, leverage there with Central Vermont coming in second. So all told, they carry about three quarters of that debt service coverage um, capacity. So, and, and so you can see here as UVM outlined, uh, 2022 projected as is would bring them to 1.90. A consultant call would occur at 1.9, and they've been gracious enough to tell us how much more of a loss it would take to get them there. And the default level as well, uh, which is the kind of the nuclear option here, uh, would be an impact of another $51 million in loss to projected margin. So um, <clears throat> looking at that, uh, they have responded to our request in that space. Uh, but it is important to know that the debt service coverage is not at an individual hospital level. It is carried at the network level, which means it's the network that borrows and it's the network that is lent to. And although, as you can see here, UVM Medical Center contributes the most to that, it is more likely than not that when they do borrow money, it is for uh, asset replacement or revitalization at the UVM Medical Center, surely based on its size and the variety of services that it offers. Getting back into the revenue piece, um, when we initially received the request from UVM, uh, there was a lot of focus on the expense side. And that is something that, of course, uh, needs to be understood. Given the environment that currently exists, <clears throat> Uh, but the one thing that we wanted to focus more on was the revenue gap, uh, the miss in budget that's occurring. And so we did ask them to provide for us uh, a set of tables that would highlight uh, where that gap may be the largest. And we wanted to see that for uh, Central Vermont, and we wanted to see that for the University of Vermont Medical Center. Those tables are in the appendix of this presentation. So anyone who wants to fast forward to the end can do so and see some of those numbers. Uh, but we wanted to illustrate for the board 
and folks following along at home where we anticipate or where UVM anticipates that landing. And what we wanted to see was what's your what was your budget for inpatient, outpatient, and professional? We wanted to see by payer, and we wanted to see where your current projection is by those service buckets, and also what your projection looks like with rate with the rate request that you've made to the Green Mountain Care Board. So in the top left here on slide 25, you can see that the commercial component of this uh, is where that net revenue impact is going to hit. You can see that the majority of that is on outpatient, and this is without uh, bad debt and free care. So those are those are some larger numbers that they ultimately will end up to be uh, once those bad debt and free care offsets are considered. But you can see the majority of it is occurring in that commercial outpatient space. When we move to the right, you can begin to see what that means uh, by the category of the service buckets. So we can see that they're missing their budget on inpatient, and that's highlighted by the light blue. And then with the green, you can see some clawback based on this the impact of this rate request. When you move over to outpatient, you can see they're missing their budget on outpatient, but more importantly, the where that net revenue is going to land based on this rate increase, it's going to bring them almost back to whole on outpatient. And then moving over to professional, they're they're missing their budget. They're going to bring back a little bit of it, but they're still anticipating on missing their budget. And so when we move down to the bottom table here, the bottom graph, you can see that in action in more detail. So the dark blue on the left hand side of each one of these categories, inpatient, outpatient, and professional. They're missing their budget currently by $28.5 million on inpatient. This rate impact is going to provide relief in the amount of $6.6 .6 million, which means they're still going to miss their budget by $21.8 million. And the same thing goes across the board here. We have the same look for Central Vermont. They're missing their outpatient budget by 19.4. This rate request is going to relieve about $16.5 million of that miss resulting in a projected miss with the rate increase of 2.8 million. And you can see on the professional side that uh, dollars for dollars, that's the place that uh, <clears throat> they're going, there's not gonna be as much relief coming from this rate component. So that's the detail that exists within the next couple of slides here where we're taking it from gross to net at a higher level. Uh, but what we're showing is in that first one is the true detail of what that request is actually going to net out at across the payers and across those service buckets. So this is more of a high level approach that captures the figures in an illustrative form that are in the appendix. And we do that for each one of the gross to net inpatient, outpatient, professional, and then the total. <clears throat> Moving to CVMC, a similar look. Again, you can tell here that the commercial component of this is going to bear the weight. Um, what's interesting, though, is that they are currently projected to exceed their budget on inpatient. And this is going to add a little bit more to that, not a whole lot. They are missing their budget on outpatient. They're going to claw back a little bit of that with the rate request, and they're missing their budget on professional, and they're going to claw back a small amount with the rate request. The SNF is a non-factor, uh, really, in this discussion. But as you move to the bottom of the screen, you can see uh, how that impact is going to affect uh, their budget to projection with the rate increase. Again, inpatient, it's already exceeding budget. It's going to go up a little bit more with this effect. Uh, the relief that uh, they're going to get in outpatient is about 3.2 million, but they're still going to miss their budget by 12.6. And moving over to professional, a very similar story. Um, they're missing their budget. The rate relief is going to be relatively minimal, and they still anticipate on missing their budget. And again, very high level uh, gross to net component here. Uh, the one difference is we've added the uh, skilled nursing facility, Woodridge, that exists uh, inside the central Vermont budget, um, but it's the same factors being put together. <clears throat> so walking through our recommendation. Now I'll be right up front. We are recommendation recommending that the board approve a rate increase not to exceed 3.5% for both UVM and Central Vermont. We were trying last week uh, to solicit information from uh, the folks at the Health Network around the inflation tables, similarly to what we did with Rutland. Uh, we did not succeed in getting the data in the way that we had hoped to do this. Um, the reason being, we wanted to quantify where they had expected 
their ordinary staff uh, inflation to be, what they are experiencing now. Similar to Rutland, they've made contract agreements uh, that are very, very different than what they anticipated in their budget with their uh, regular provider staff, or at least uh, certain groups of the regular provider staff. And then we also wanted to see if they didn't plan for anything in the uh, inflation category for contract labor, how has that changed? Workforce has been the cornerstone of this presentation from UVM Health Network Hospitals. And we really wanted to see, okay, what are the expectations here as it relates to inflation for their staff and as it relates to inflation for contract labor? And how can we begin to quantify that in a way that can help us get to uh, or even validate the rate request that was put before us? And we couldn't do that. We could not get to that point. <clears throat> uh, but that said, um, we recognize that inflation is a very real factor. Uh, for those of us who work and, and breathe in this space, uh, it's not a it's not a secret. And so recognizing from the finance team that something is happening in this space uh, is really the bulk of why uh, we made a request that is more than zero. Um, but the fact that we could not get around to the 10% uh, that UVM proposed uh, has a lot to do with the uh, informational components uh, that we felt were missing. So we recognize that inflation is a factor in this space. We recognize the need for relief, uh, but doubling back on the 10% request in this environment and the volatility that exists and how quickly this situation has ramped up for hospitals, including the two making the request, we think it's prudent to provide some relief, uh, but not in the amount that was requested of us. We have a more formidable and formal budget process coming up here in a few months in which things can be uh, vetted with more time and more attention and that and also perhaps by that time the environmental factors have changed in a way that is not committing this board to a massive rate increase so <clears throat> we think that there's there is some logic behind approving a small increase uh, of course when you build that into their current base it does bring it up uh, to 9.56 for UVM and 9.5 for Central Vermont, respectively, which in their own right are large base increases. We recognize that and what that means. Uh, however, uh, those factors uh, really are the reason why we believe in a rate increase, but not quite going to the full amount. Additionally, their five year history, as I alluded to, puts both of these hospitals in a five year average rate history of 3.5%. And so using that historical factor, which we do in budgets as well, um, is where we ended up landing and that we felt it was appropriate to provide a small level of relief built around that 3.5% average for both of these hospitals in their gross charge increases. So we think that as they move to a 3.5% essentially increase for 2022 over 2021, that is a substantial base increase. We recognize the volatility and we recognize the environment in which this is being made, but we think it would be prudent uh, not to go much farther than that until more information is clear. Maybe things calm down uh, in this space and the board can look back with clearer eyes in the July and August timeframe in their normal budget process where even more and consistent information is requested outside of the mid-year approach. So I'll navigate to Central Vermont just to show uh, highlight the numbers that I just spoke to um, <clears throat> and the logic behind that. And then into the appendix, here are those numbers that we illustrated in the various graphs uh, back on the previous slides. Uh, so that really brings us right to the end of our presentation, and I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, for the board questions and comments, I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order and start with our newest board member, Tom Walsh. Tom. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Patrick and staff, for, um, for that analysis. Um, I had a chance to review the slides and consider the recommendation. And for me, at least at this point, I'm interested in what the other board members have to say. Um, I have a hard time getting to even the 3.5. We're transitioning to fixed prospective payments where people manage within their budget. And 
Um, there's no mid-year increases. That's that's part of any of the programs that we're looking at going forward. And this is um, the reason for that is to share risk, right? Um, we've all been through a pandemic. We're all dealing with the after effects. Um, UVMC has um, a $1.7 billion business, and it's facing a 2.2% loss in 22. That's from slide 13. CVMC has a $270 million business and is facing a 1.8% loss in 22. Um, their days cash on hand are shrinking. The projection is 118 days on average between the two places. But if we consider the 2.2% loss and the 1.8% loss, and return to slide 19 with the table with the graphs that were there. Um, that chart shows that CVMC had a loss of an a loss in their operating margin of 3.8% in 2018. They improved that to a loss of 2.1% for a difference of 1.7%. They improved their performance 1.7%. I believe that can be done again. And if that is done, if that were done, if both places were able to figure out how to do that, UVMC would be looking at a 0.5% loss. And CVMC would be looking at a 0.1. So I believe that effort, whatever happened at CVMC, that effort when they were faced with their biggest loss to date, bigger than what they're facing now with no relief, that effort can be done again. And the projected loss that they're facing right now is not unprecedented, but a mid-year request for a 10% increase is. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're gonna go to board member Pelham, Tom. Trying to get my mic to work here. Um, thank you, and thank you, Patrick, for all this work. Um, I, uh, uh, at our last meeting on this topic, I said that I'm kind of trying to uh, understand or or get my arms around uh, the short-term um, issue of addressing these these problems for these particular hospitals versus the long-term. Um, and kind of uh, Jenny Samuelson said the same thing in that last paragraph of her letter, um, which is stability versus sustainability. And I, I uh, think I'm coming down on the side of sustainability. Um, I, I, $33 million in commercial revenue, which is I think what's in play here, is a big number. Um, and when you look at the distribution you know, of, of say margin across hospitals, the network hospitals, um, um, uh, UVM, Porter, and, and Central Vermont. Central Vermont's usually been a drag, but but um, but between the three of them, you know, they uh, they they have over the past five years um, kind of occupied um, about 85, 86 percent of the total margin. So I. You know, it, it's it's um, it's it's always hard work, but when I think about pushing this issue um, into the arena with the concerns and issues and needs of the other hospitals in Vermont, um, that seems to me to be the better place to go. We've we've already started our our 2023 budget process. We've approved guidelines that are available. And so um, we've kind of dropped the puck, so to speak, on uh, fiscal 2023. Um, and so what is there that will happen between now and acting here and what will versus what might happen or can happen um, in the, uh, you know, in, in the summer months during the hospital budget process? Well, the legislature will probably have been left. So we don't know the results of what the legislature will do. They haven't adjourned yet, but um, there are issues of workforce initiatives and uh, money for the hospital uh, budget stabilization effort. 
uh, that are still in play. The 2023 budget process is slightly different. Um, I think uh, beneficially different uh, than the uh, prior ones in that it stretches the decision making by hospitals over a two year period up against a, a cumulative target for, for two years. Um, and the um, this request um, is basically uh, not in accord or balanced with our healthcare reform goals in that it's substantially fee for service. You know, there's no fixed perspective payment here or any of the elements that 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 we're trying to work to to work toward. Um, the uh, in in this uh, coming summer month, I was very happy to see. Let me just find my quote here. I was happy to see uh, Don George um, from Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, in his letter opposing. Not that I, I, I applaud his letter opposing this, but in his letter uh, to us, he stated. We must turn determinedly toward value based payments and global hospital budgets to think more holistically about patient health rather than incentivizing volume by uh, paying for each service uh, individually. Now, this is from uh, an entity, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, an MVP that collectively among hospitals has less than 2% of their payments um, uh, aligned with a uh, fixed perspective payment. And uh, and that is kind of comparable to um, Medicaid and Medicare. Back up. I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, yeah, Medicaid if uh, you're not speaking, could you please put yourself on mute, um, whoever is uh, bleeding through? So Medicaid and Medicare payments are up to 43% and 34% respectively with fixed perspective payments, although they're not true fixed perspective payments, at least they've got um, a couple of wars in the water in that regard, as opposed to commercial. And so here we are looking at another $33 million in commercial that's totally divorced from uh, uh, healthcare reform. Um, we have, uh, you know, the hospital, hopefully the hospital sustainability project will be at least uh, uh, up and running by the time you, we get into the hospital budget process. The all-payer model renewal, um, we have not received that yet, but we should have that hopefully by the time we're in, into uh, our 2023 budget process. Um, the global commitment 1115 waiver um, is also up for renewal. Um, and I just, uh, when I read Secretary Samuelson's letter, I went and kind of found the latest quarterly report of uh, you know of the section Vermont Section 1115 demonstration year, and when it comes to budget neutrality, that quarterly report says, and and I I I, I don't understand this, but uh, that we've got to understand this by the time we get into the hospital budget process. But the report says, overall, the budget neutrality exercise indicates that for September, for the September 2021 quarter, the state's total with waiver expenditures were $95.5 million, lower than the total without waiver, um, uh, indicating a quarterly super surplus. This compares to a surplus of $73.9 million reported in, in, uh, in, in the June quarter, and a total calendar year 2021 surplus to date of $272.9 million. So there may be some gold in those hills, there may be no gold in those hills. I don't know, but it's the kind of thing that 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 we can explore in the um, uh, in, in 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 the normal organized, disciplined budget process. And so I I think that's my biggest concern is is this ad hoc process uh, um, just seems to me to be kind of positioned at a critical turning point which I think is fiscal year 2023 and uh, takes a large chunk of commercial um, revenue um, and puts it in play now as opposed to through that budget process. And I was, I've also been um, uh, impressed with the many letters that we got um, from people, both businesses and individuals who say that this mid-year adjustment would be very disruptive in their personal lives or in their commercial lives. 
and and that weighs on me as well. So um, I uh, and I you know the three and a half percent that's proposed by the staff today is new to me. Uh, I you know I just I just think that uh, it's small relative to the requests, and I just think that we're we're we we'd be better situated to deal with this in the normal budget process. That's my two my, my take on it now. Thank you, Tom. Next, we'll turn to board member Lunch, Robin. Thank you. Um, so I actually did have some questions. Um, so are your questions for Patrick or for UVM? Because if they're for UVM, I'd like to have them sworn in. I think, well, I think they're probably for UVM because they're about the, or UVM or CVMC, um, because it's related to materials that they submitted. I don't know if Patrick and team would be able to respond to it or not. So why don't we um, swear in the witnesses? And um, last week it was Alan Rick, but I do see Steve here and I did have a question for him um, when I get my chance. So um, is that okay that we swear the three of you in, Al? We, we, we'd like to stick with the two that we had last week, Chair Mullen. But if if you have something for Steve later on, we could we could do that. But we're we're the presenters. Okay. So um, Kim, are you able to swear them in? Are you in state? I am. Yes. So I'm just swearing two people, correct? Yes. It's okay. Al Gobey and Rick Vincent. Yep. Okay. All right. Great. Would you please raise your right hands? Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, the first question that I had related relates to the issue of volumes. Um, so. Uh, you did speak last week to some of the issues related to volumes, particularly in inpatient and the challenges with the average length of stay extending. Um, what I would like to understand better is the dynamics in each hospital that are happening around outpatient and professional services, uh, particularly uh, I would note that for UVM, the professional services is significantly under what was budgeted, and I'd like to understand uh, what's going on there. But if you could please answer the question for both hospitals, both for outpatient and for professional. Rick, do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, Robin, if it's not in what we uh, what we provided, which I think Patrick has, I think to give you, I don't want to just kind of speak off the cuff um, in terms of answering that question. Um, I mean, the question that we were asked was specific around inpatient and breaking out some of the detail behind our net patient revenue number, which I think was in the presentation that um, that that. Uh, that Patrick provided, but if you want more detailed explanation on what's happening in each individual segment, such as something we'll have to we'll have to get back to you. Well, you have the burden of proof, um, so if you, you know, can't answer the question or choose not to provide information, then I'll just tell you that from my perspective, I'm not getting the information I need to make a decision. I may be in the minority there. Other people, obviously, Tom and Tom feel like they have the information they need. But I'll just remind you that you have the burden of proof. Uh, and so it's in your interest to fully answer questions. Um, I just, yeah, I just want to make sure we don't provide you with information that is inaccurate or is um, is just kind of generalized when we when we provide the, the the answers to these questions, we try to be as detailed as possible, um, and so we just want to make sure that that's what we're we're doing in this case as well. Okay. Rick, is your camera uh, not working? Uh, no, I should be on. Do, do other others see Rick? I see him, Mr. Chair. Yeah, you're black, okay. also, Al. So maybe there's. So I see like Al, but I don't see Rick. Oh. <laughs> I see neither Al nor, oh, now I saw Rick, but I don't see Al. But either way, I, I'm fine. I don't need to see people. 
I'm looking at my notes anyway. Do you want to finish this? Do you need to understand more about that, Kevin, or can I continue? No, go ahead. OK. Um, so my other question was related to uh, days cash on hand in the materials. Um, you indicated that the day's cash estimates were without any remaining Medicare dollars. Could you please explain that? So we, um, and that is a difference I just uh, saw in the kind of the presentation in terms of the day's cash on hand numbers for the, the staff. So we, we report day's cash on hand without the Medicare payments that we're still paying back um because they're not they're not ours um we we have to they're taken out of the taken out of our claims as medicare um pays us for services that we've uh, provided they uh, they started with 25 percent reduction in payment uh, for six months and then it moved to to 50 percent so for us that's not cash that you know we can count on because it's going to have to be paid back and it's also the way that we need to record we need to report the day's cash on hand to the rating agencies um, they're consistent across the country in terms of how we report that the number in the presentation um, obviously um, includes um, uh, the presentation today includes um, those dollars that still need to be uh, still need to be paid back okay thank you I just wanted to that was my assumption, but I just wanted to confirm that what was removed was the Medicare dollars that need to be paid back. Um, and then I, I know. Um, I did read the email related to the inflation table. Um, that were provided for both UVM and CVMC in that table, it indicated there is a 19.3% increase in wages and compensation for non medical staff. Could you speak a little bit more to um, what the wage increases were to whom and when those were applied or will be applied during this fiscal year? And they're mostly applied to um, some of our entry, uh, actually a lot of our entry level roles. So environmental uh, services, uh, security, nutrition, um, those roles we've had a hard time uh, recruiting. Um, and so the majority of those that are outside of that, uh, that clinical area have been applied to, uh, to those roles. They've been occurring um, essentially since um, you know December January timeframe uh, when uh, when we really started to and even you know even before even before that when we really started to to, to struggle to recruit um, those staff it, they've taken the form of um, permanent salary adjustments so we've made market adjustments um, to some positions uh, some form of the increases have come from uh retention payments um and we use those retention payments to ensure that um that you know the the inflationary pressures that we're feeling and then the lack of ability to recruit you know is it here to stay or not and retention payments is a way to kind of bridge that gap to make sure you're not making permanent salary adjustments um, as you wait to see exactly how things uh play out but um, those have all been um at various times through this fiscal year, those have all been applied primarily to the to those more entry level roles. OK, and it sounded I may be misremembering, but from your the answers to questions, it sounded like the retention payments, however, were not included in that 19.3. Am I not understanding that correctly? Sorry, the 19.3 that you're referencing, Robin? So that's in the inflation tables that you were asked to submit for UVM MC the fiscal year 22 mid-year adjustment and I don't know if Patrick if you have those available and maybe you could pull them up yeah so those retention payments are in there Robin I'm following now okay um, and do you know how much those were um, so in total um, just going back to the email, so we provided more detail in the email as well. Um, okay. 
I did read the detail uh, in the email, but it was a little confusing to me because it sounded like you had excluded those from the chart. So that's what I'm just trying to understand and clear up. Yeah, it looks like probably the majority. Um, so the UVM Medical Center um, had uh, 12 million in sign-on retention payments with the vast majority of that 12 million being retention payments um, and CVMC had 3 million. Again, the vast majority being retention payments. Thank you, Patrick. And this is the CVMC chart you have off. Yes, because I can tell from the magnitude of the dollars. Okay, so of that 103 approximately, um, 12 million would have been related to the retention and sign off. And the rest would have been um, the, the either market adjustments or other salary increases, is that right? Correct. And traveler um, uh, expense as well. Okay. And there was another um, document that you provided that had the traveler dollars broken out, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Those were my questions. Um, so, I. In terms of where I'm at, um, I am concerned particularly around CVMC's financial position. As others have noted, CVMC has had a number of years um, of missing the budget. I think we did have a discussion about that during the budget process in terms of ensuring that we were not approving uh, what we've been referring to in other contexts as aspirational budgets. I think mid-year it's difficult to to really sort out how much of that miss is related to sort of the budget being too high and unrealistic versus how much of the 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 miss in terms of NPR is related to other factors. I don't feel like I understand that. Um, I would be inclined to approve some sort of rate increase for CVMC, despite the fact that I very much agree with others that mid-year is tough. Uh, other people have made budgets based on their expectations around health insurance. This obviously throws that off. Um, the fact that NPR, however, is coming in under is a balancing factor in my mind, because presumably the budgets folks made were off of the total budget um, and not this lowered number. Um, however, uh, to be frank, I think the source of some of our questions, including the inflation chart, was to give us and staff a way to get to a number less than 10 percent. And so not having that information clearly laid out in a way that our staff can analyze it makes it difficult to come up with a solid rationale for picking a number. So that has so that I don't know where that has left me. So I'll just say that. Um, with UVM, um, I would say that I think with UVM, there's more ability to absorb the fluctuations. Um, and I, and to, just to be frank, I'm not really sure where I am with UVM as of this second. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll turn to board board member Jessica Holmes. Jessica. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, my focus is on a few areas, has been on a few areas with both of the rate requests that have come in um, from both Rutland and from the health network. So one of the focus areas is whether the unexpected inflationary pressures are temporary or permanent. Um, you know, in the case for Rutland, most of the unexpected expense growth for Rutland came from one-time retention bonuses and temporary staffing. Um, it seems to me, although I share the concerns that Robin and the staff had, it's very difficult to parse out uh, for both UVM and CVMC what are the long-term wage increases for their permanent staff versus temporary retention bonuses um, and contract staffing. It, it's it's all rolled up in there. I know, Rick, you just mentioned what um, some of the retention bonuses are, but you also said that 
some of the contract staffing is also embedded in that number. So uh, for me, I, I'm, I'm really trying to understand and unpack what are the costs that are going to be incurred indefinitely and obviously resulted from the need to retain critical workforce uh, during this pandemic, but that are going to be contracted now indefinitely. So I'm still trying to figure that out and I can't quite get at it from the inflation table. Um, but I can I'll ask a question perhaps at the end that may get us there. Uh, in terms of reserves, um, I also focus on reserves, right? Can these reserves uh, cover the unforeseen expenses that are happening mid-year? Again, in the case of Rutland, Rutland had over 200 days cash on hand, something like 244, and they were projected to end the year with at least 200 days cash on hand. So in my mind, they were in a better financial position than either UVM or CVMC. Um, According to the, you know, UVM's presentation last week, uh, the days cash on hand as a, in January was already down to 157 days cash on hand. Again, excluding the, the Medicare payments that have to be paid back. So I think that's the appropriate measure. That's not their money. Maybe sitting in their bank, but it's not their money, right? So 157 days cash on hand is where we, they were in January. To me, that's well below the benchmarks for rating agencies. That's usually around 250, right, to get an A rating. And why do we care about that? Because ratings affect the ability to borrow. And we do ex expect our tertiary care center to be able to borrow for capital investments. Um, and so that's a concern of mine. Uh, CVMC is an institution that has not generated positive operating margins since 2016. And it's projected to end the year at 82 days cash on hand. Again, pretty low and worrisome. Um, and even if the board approved the full rate request, both institutions are going to end the year in red. So these rate requests aren't even going to get them into the black, right? They're still going to end the year in red. So that kind of gives you a sense of how badly in the hole these two institutions are, in my mind. Um, is there room for increased productivity, faster throughput of patients, improved efficiency? Yes, I think there is. And my experiences on the wait time review suggests, yes, there's room for improvement there. And I hope that in the budget process this August, we can hear some of the steps that particularly UVM is taking to, to improve that throughput and patient flow and reduce wait times. But I do think it's important to say that we rely heavily on our tertiary care center to have the resources to be able to invest in the most advanced technology, the infrastructure, and hiring the best doctors that we can in Vermont um, to take care of our sickest patients. And so I will say the predicted losses and the shrinking reserves at UVM are worrisome to me. And CVMC's consistent and predicted losses and low cash flow position are also troubling. I also just want to note, we were supposed to hear today about a um, new psych uh, inpatient project that would be built, proposed at CVMC, largely funded by UVM. So this is going to take a significant capital expenditure. It's not likely to be a high margin center. In fact, it's probably going to be a loss center. But it's potentially, you know, we haven't heard and we will hear, but potentially meets a very important unmet need in the state and will require resources to do that. So, you know, I, I struggle with the, the, the need to balance, you know, um, hospitals having the resources to provide the highest quality care for our, you know, Vermonters. With the need to keep healthcare affordable, I'm sympathetic to a lot of the all of the public comments received from small businesses and families who can't afford increases in healthcare costs. Where I was landing and where I was hoping I could get data was supporting a rate increase that would cover or at least defray the unplanned permanent wage increases that were negotiated on behalf of full-time permanent employees. All right, so. You know, say, for example, you budgeted 3% for your nurses and, you know, you gave them 3% and then you gave them an additional 10%. That's unexpected increases in nursing salaries moving forward indefinitely, right? So that, to me, could justify a potential, you know, rate increase. But I can't figure out from the inflation table what are the average, you know, rate increases for employees, in permanent employees. It looked like from the inflation table that um, there were no dis unplanned increases in MD salaries. Really where it came in was in the non-MD salary. And in the inflation table, it suggests that it's a 19% increase in average wages of non-medical staff. But it sounds like that includes permanent and non-permanent employees and um, and also includes one-time retention bonuses. So if it's possible to get 
uh, the average increase in wage for permanent non-MD staff, that would be really helpful to me if I'm making clear my request. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. I thought we completed the 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 file as requested and we added some additional information in the email as well. Um, it, we didn't get any we didn't get any feedback on what was provided, um, but yes, that is something that um, that can be uh, provided. Thank you. That'd be helpful. Is that it, Jess? Yeah, I mean, those are my thoughts. That's the information that I feel like. Actually, I have one other. Let me just ask one other question of you, Rick. I'm, this is a curiosity to me, but in that inflation table, it looked like CVMC was seeing a 4% decrease in per unit drug costs, where UVMMC was seeing a 9% increase in per unit drug costs. And I'm just curious as to why CVMC would be seeing a decrease in per unit drug costs. So if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, but I think that table was comparing to to budget um not not a trend factor um so um that that's just that the the the, the increase was less than what we planned in the 22 budget is that how that was presented patrick yep so you provided your budget version and then what your projection and experience is now and the reason, Jessica, obviously, there's a lot more different types of treatments and drugs used at the um, at the UVM Medical Center. That um, um, likely some of the more um, higher complexity um, uh, drug um, courses are the ones that went up in price versus kind of more uh, kind of okay. standard that are done at CDMC. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. So those are my questions, um, Kevin and. That the one piece of information that I just need is is what I just talked about. Hey, okay, thank you, Jess. So, um, Al, the question I was going to ask uh, Steve, but I'll ask you. Um, you know, UVM over the years um, during my time here has been great communicators, and um, usually never see anything um, in the news before it's communicated to us, but. Recently, and I understand the circumstances, so I'm not trying to lay any fault on anybody. I'm just trying to get some information about it. Um, we saw the story about the broken pipes in the OR. Is that a, a quick fix? And can you just run a little bit uh, uh, longer hours to uh, get everybody caught up so that uh, nobody's uh, surgeries are left behind? And um, does it have any impact on what you've already projected for your um, numbers for the rest of the year? Yeah, so Kevin, thank, thanks for the question. Um, so that happened on Saturday night, um, late. Um, we worked on it overnight. We worked on it all day Sunday. You know, basically as of today, we're 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 getting back to you know what we think of as close to 100%. Could be could be tomorrow. We're working on the delayed cases and things that were moved to Fanny to try to you know take care of the folks over the next week or two. So we're hoping that that it's just a, you know, the impact of a, you know, of a few days, and not not anything more than that. And so, you know, hopefully, opti you know, we have a little bit of optimism right now that it's going well and the the cleanup is going well. Great, thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, on slide 24, um, there was information about the uh, um, relative. Uh, um, relationships between the, the different entities um, and the total health network picture. Um, I guess I I, did, I took the question that was asked by my colleague last week a little bit differently, and that's probably my fault. I probably read more into it, but I was looking more to get an update on um, what what type of an impact the three hospitals that we don't get to regulate because they're not any in our borders are having on you. Have you had to transfer any funds over? Are they um, helping or hurting with the current situation? So we haven't had to transfer any funds over. Um, they actually, uh, so New York has a 
has a critical access hospital um, in our network, just uh, just like we have in Vermont. So they're uh, they're doing fine, just as our Vermont critical access hospital is doing, because um, you know they're that you know the costs plus reimbursement uh, there will help to cover the higher uh, cost inflation um, uh, that they're incurring. Uh, CVPH and Alice Hyde are, you know, roughly, um, you know, in the same kind of general uh, vicinity. Maybe even doing a little bit, you know, better than the than the UVM Medical Center in terms of size and scale. Um, so they're not negatively impacting, uh, kind of where any more so than the Vermont hospitals in terms of where we're at as a as a network. Thanks, Rick. So. Um, like Robin, I was especially concerned with Central Vermont Medical Center, and this has been a troubled entity for a number of years that predates UVM even being there. And uh, we heard, I believe it was three years ago during the normal budget process um, from Todd Keating, who had spent some time as an interim CEO at uh, Central Vermont uh, at the time that he felt he had the makings of a plan to turn it around. And Todd has retired. I'm just curious um, if you were able to implement uh, Todd's ideas for improving Central Vermont Medical Center and um, were they successful? And where do you see that uh, going in the future? Yeah, so, yeah, so go, go ahead, Rick. Go ahead, Rick. Um, so I think, you know, if you go back to um, uh, Patrick's chart, I think, you know, showing the showing the margin uh, impact over the years, I think we, you know, we we have started to make some um, uh, some progress, um, but just like the UVM Medical Center and, you know, others, the impact of the, the pandemic, uh, um, you know, the cyber attack has um, somewhat um, kept back some of those um, um, improvement efforts, not that they haven't been implemented and we haven't seen the kind of the fruits of that work, but it's somewhat, you know, being offset by, you know, the, you know, the, the impacts of those two uh, events. So once we get beyond uh, kind of where we're at, which, you know, uh, right now we're in this workforce challenge issue, which is why we're, you know, we're, we're here today. Um, once we get past this um, this period in time, I think those those things that we've put in place and so, and some additional work that still need to be done will be much more apparent. Uh, but I think the pandemic, um, the cyber attack, and the workforce challenges have somewhat masked what um, you know the good work that has been done. Um, so I, I think that's you know that, I think that good work is in part being you know somewhat hidden uh, when you look at uh, when you look at those results. Yeah, and, and Chair, Chair Mullen, I'd like to just add a few things. I mentioned back in August that CVMC um, has an underdeveloped pharmacy program, and that's something we're working on. And it's it sort of sticks out when you look at the, the just the raw numbers over time. But I'd also call out years. 17 and 18 for both NPR and rate. They were, there was a pre-negotiated uh, rate for UVM uh, MC and for CVMC. So the budgets that were submitted were basically um, lower than would have been needed on a five-year trend because of basically the margin of UVM MC the year prior. And so that had a huge impact on the rate structure of CVMC over time. And if you look at your chart from that time, you, you put them together on a five year, those years, um, you know, basically are, you know, almost zeros that you're averaging into a five year rate. And so they stick out and, and I would call that out to the, out to the board. And last, um, we did just put Epic into CVMC on November 6th, and we are seeing um, uh, positive signs from that. Um, a lot of the hospital was still on what we think of as paper um, to some extent. And so, you know, that will have an organizing effect and will impact the finances moving forward. And so um, ju just a few points. 
Al, to follow up on that, um, you transferred a number of surgeries, at least that was the uh, communication that um, what you could do um, at CVMC, you were moving patients over, um, so they weren't uh, affected by the uh, um, problems at Fannie Allen. And I'm just curious why that didn't improve the margins at CVMC. Well, it's, you know, it's hard to move surgeries. You know, that's not, you know, that's not easy to do. Let me just say that. And so, you know, a lot of that, you know, you, you just can't, you know, make it happen that easily or that quickly. So, it, you know, it happened to some extent, but not enough to, to really impact the margin. You know, but, but also, you know, let's remember that, you know, the last three years, you know, we were, I thought, I think we were pretty clear last week, you know, we have been incredibly impacted, our volumes, our margin, by the pandemic, by the waves of the pandemic, what we've, you know, we were, we had to stop doing things at CVMC just to maintain beds, you know, during the two major surges of the pandemic. And both of those were during the Fannie closure. And so, you know, we've just, it, it's been a, it's been an and and an and and an and, you know, of um, tough cards out of the deck, not, you know, with, a, with very few easy cards. Um, so, you know, sort of, sort of a mixed answer there, but that, you know, there's a lot to unpack, but it, all of it, the cumulative impact is a sea of red here that should concern every Vermont citizen. It is very concerning. Al, um, I'm sure that you've read uh, the secretary's letter on, uh, what help might be available. Um, I didn't see a lot there. Um, you were on television with Stuart Ledbetter, um, sounding very optimistic that there would be increases, and um, maybe you know something that this board doesn't. Um, but I, I would just say this: you know, in the past week, there was a, a significant article in the New York Times about um, whether or not the cost shift is real. The argument was made that it's not real, and that where hospitals. Um, see uh, reductions in uh, government payments. There's also reductions in commercial payments. Um, it doesn't really ring true to me. Um, I've been talking about the cost shift for over two decades. Um, I believe that uh, I was part of the group that was labeled by then Governor Dean as a bonehead, and we proudly wore buttons that said bonehead for health care. And um, I think that over time, it just continues to grow the difference between commercial and government payers. And it's so frustrating because um, you can see that there has to be some cost shift, but the magnitude of it just continues to grow. So do you have any positive news for us at all? I don't have any positive news in that regard. I, you know, I will say to support uh, your, you know, the bonehead pin team, you know, look at critical access hospitals. Medicare recognizes that costs have to be covered, at least for the part of the revenue that is Medicare. And they're in a whole uh, different situation right now. I mean, we have two of them and they're and they're fine. And we have other hospitals that are paid differently. And the only place to turn uh, for you, if you want to do anything today, is to commercial payers. And so whatever we want to call it, we could, you know, call it anything um the situation is real and you know we're you know we're caught in this position where you know we're debating whether or not inflation is transitory or here to stay and we're literally dealing with days cash on hand coming down as we pay the very real bills that we we don't label them transitory or or real they're they're just our the bills we're paying and we we understand that the business community is seeing the same inflation in their expenses, but you know we've got to cover ours, and and I just think that um, you know that that gets caught a missed it gets kind of missed in this conversation that you know these are real costs, um, and uh, you know they need to be paid, or we end up with this red, and then uh, you know we're not healthy enough to do the things we need to do as 
uh, Member Holmes accurately pointed out. Thanks, Al. Thank you. The uh, points have already been made, but I just want to uh, reiterate that uh, UVM is where the lion's share of our providers are trained. It is our Mac academic medical center. They have been leaders in value-based payments and all the good things that you do on a daily basis, Al, um, I'm trying to weigh against the fact that uh, I just don't believe in, in a mid-year adjustment unless it's what I would call a situation that would place you in um, default. But let me ask you this question. Even if you got what you asked for today, with that loss and what transpired last year, do you anticipate the ability to keep your current bond rating? Um, so, you know, they're they're waiting and they're watching this to be quite candid. Um, they want to know how this goes. Um, I have thought that we that um, we might get a. Uh, either our bond rating affirmed or our outlook changed to negative, I would hope that none of this would lead to a negative, uh, to a downgrade. Um, but again, they're they're watching us um, and they're watching this to see you know, what's gonna happen. We are the only health system, we are the only state that has this kind of regulation. You know, we're an N of one and you know, I, it, you know, it's very hard to to explain um, why, you know, even though we're seeing cost increases, we our our hands are are tied to do anything to adjust to them. And so, you know, again, hope we're affirmed. Um, we worked hard in the meetings to explain where we're at, but um, you know, you know, they're good at what they do. You know, it, it uh, is such a difficult uh, decision, and uh, I would hope that uh, they would realize that even if the uh, regulatory body didn't give you what you asked for today, that um, the reason for that would be not that they don't recognize that you need it, it's that it's it's rare to do a mid-year adjustment. And uh, so th that weighs on me what effect this is going to have on you. We don't want to see it uh, going in the opposite direction. Um, there, there's a lot into what is here. I do believe that uh, Robin uh, hit a very strong point and that the burden of proof is on you asking for the mid-year adjustment to justify it. I think for the most part you have. I don't believe that um, to use your word, Al, I don't believe that the additional cost inflation that you're seeing is transitory. I don't see um, how it can be transitory when you have locked in a three-year contract with your nurses that was necessary to do. Um, you're not the only hospital that had to do it. And um, there are no money trees that you go out and pick the money off of just to uh, bring people's pay up to uh, um, try to create a, a better working situation so that uh, they don't feel abused when they're standing next to a, a traveler that's making more. And so um, these are very hard decisions. And um, with that, I'll throw it back to any follow-ups from any board members. Mr. Chair, could I just make one comment before you before you move on? About Certainly. The, so uh, about Patrick's, um, uh, concern about our submittal or answering of questions. Uh, to, to the best of my ability, I thought we answered them all. Um, I, I'm not sure if we missed something or, or, or what happened there. Yeah, so I'll weigh in on that. It was around the inflation table, <clears throat> and I can bring that back up to share here. We had this broken out right here to have you separate. Patrick, we don't see it yet. Oh, there, now we do. Oh, sorry, I pulled it down. Hold on, fun with technology. Okay, let me know when you can see it again. Uh, 
Okay. Is it? Got it. Okay. Got it, good. Patrick. So this this bottom part here in the asterisk is exact is is the uh, reason why we're having this discussion is that when you put in your budget, you didn't have any contract staffing inflationary components. Okay, which is fine because you only know what you know at that point in time. But with your presentation, you've acknowledged that the costs that you're incurring from travelers that is over what you budgeted is not just related to the amount of persons you're now employing from a traveler's perspective. It's also the added cost. So <clears throat> you had noted that you had 80 people in your budget, 167,000 on average per for a budget of 13.4 million. In your projection, you have 405 persons at 285,000, which is projected at 115 and a half million. So what we wanted to see here is you've had changes that you've discussed already in the wages and compensation of what board member Holmes said was your, your permanent staff. We wanted to see in that contract and staffing line right there, what are the new components that are, are the inflation component of that traveler. So you have a need for 405 persons. It's 325 more than you budgeted for, but we're not going to get into the need for those individuals. We want to understand the inflationary burden that that has put on you. So even if you had had <clears throat> um, the original 80 FTEs at the new 285,000, it would have put you at about 22.8 million. That's not a budget buster by by uh, by reason of comparison to what you're currently experiencing. Yeah. So, so we want to see you break. We want to see you break that out as she described, where we're seeing what are those those necessary permanent wage inflationary factors versus the ones in your contracted staff. Yeah. Patrick, totally understand. But to okay. be fair to those listening, we we you know we submitted this at 3:43 on Monday, and we didn't hear anything back. And we're glad to work to getting to your intent here. We don't, you know, we're as transparent as as anyone could be with our numbers. So I just want to make sure everyone knows that we submitted what we thought were answers to every question. And if there's any need for more information or clarification, we are, we stand ready and are always ready to do that. So. Yep. Al, it had more to do with the turnaround between totally when, we, yep. when we received that and, and the recommendation that we have to had to have excuse yep. me, had to have into the board yesterday for this presentation. So um, we did not expect a vote to happen today. So there's room now to work on this between now and Friday, and I can resubmit uh, the tables you've provided to me for that effort. Fair enough, thank you. Sir. And I meant to say at the start of the meeting that uh, uh, although I was hopeful that we could have a vote today, that it was probably unlikely and that we have scheduled a meeting at eight o'clock on Friday. Um, and my goal is to have a decision this week. And um, I would hope that any board members that have any questions that they would get them out now so that answers can be um, received tomorrow and people are fully prepared to come in on Friday to uh, make a decision. So board members, if you have any additional items that you would like from UVM or from Patrick, please say so now. So there really aren't that many items, Al and Rick. I think that uh, you ought to be able to turn this around quite quickly and uh, get it back to us the earlier tomorrow that we can get it, the better off we are so that nobody says they didn't have time to uh, take a look at it. And uh, hopefully we can uh, come to a, a swift conclusion of this hearing on Friday morning. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer comment at this time? Um, Jeff Tiemann, welcome Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, like you said, I'm Jeff Tiemann with the Vermont Association of Hospitals. I, I do not usually wade into individual hospital budget discussions. But I did want to make some brief comments today that I think apply to both this hearing and the broader hospital field going forward. You know, if if the pandemic proved anything, I think it was that hospitals are a really crucial and indispensable part of our public health infrastructure. And, and I do want to note that UVMMC 
um, which you you know nicely pointed out, Kevin, is our only academic medical center and and a, a really important resource from that standpoint, was a was a crucial component of our response, helping resource and and coordinate the work in countless ways from the start. And this is this is really important because whether it's the academic medical center or any of our other community hospitals and rural hospitals, they just can't afford to falter. I, I certainly hope we never find ourselves in another similar moment in the future where we're facing a global pandemic or something similar. But if we do, I think we'll all want to look back and say we made wise choices that kept our hospitals stable um, and that made sure they were resourced to meet the needs of patients and communities. I, I do think both Rutland and the Health Network also made very clear the effect of inflation and workforce issues which I would argue are in fact absolutely extraordinary and unprecedented. You can parse the details, but the overall picture is not one we've ever seen or managed before, or one that I think is likely to change anytime soon, as I think a couple board members pointed out. Um, it was also mentioned in the staff presentation, historical actions taken by the board relative to UVMMC. And I, I just wanna emphasize here that all hospitals do everything in their power to meet the budget guidance, which involves decisions upstream of when you see their budgets. And those choices do represent opportunity costs. It could be a program that's not expanded, a clinic that's not renovated, um, a, a new piece of equipment that's not purchased or an EMR that doesn't get updated, or even a new service that's put on the back burner. Um, in, in the last several weeks, we've listened to dialogue around three hospitals in need. And from my perspective, having worked so closely with these hospitals and all of our hospitals over the past incredibly challenging two plus years, to underfund any of these organizations is, is problematic um, for the hospitals themselves and more importantly for the Vermonters they serve. So, you know, this board has rightly focused a lot of attention on sustainability of both our hospitals and the system, and I think has the power to make choices right here that support that sustainability. So um, thank you as always for listening. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'm gonna to turn to Walter Carpenter. Walter. Hey, Kevin, can you hear me now? I can. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> just a couple things, really more comments and questions. I've read all of the public comments that came in. I agree with most, with all of them, good many of them. Uh, Tommy Walsh kind of said what I was thinking, so I won't repeat that. Um, and per Kevin, I've also been called a bonehead many times. <laughs> In fact, I get called that more often, just as often as not. And I think as I listen to this discussion and remember my time going through the system, I think one of the hardest things to listen to is all this stuff about payer mixes and all the rest of it, because you have a feeling that the patient is more of a product, a commodity going through here. And this is not a healthcare system. This is an industrial system. And I think that is at the, the main problem of what's all going on here. And look, there's only so much money that Vermonters have. You know, we make 15, 16, 20 bucks an hour, something like that. And you can't bleed us too much more. You know, if you do, it's all going to come crashing down. And you're bleeding us. So that's all I have. Thank you, Walter. Next, I'm going to turn to Rick Dooley. Mm -hmm. Rick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to, uh, speaking for health first for our independent practices, you know, we've all heard a lot about the difficult circumstances that the hospital has faced. Um, and I just sort of want to remind the board that those same circumstances have applied to businesses across the state, indeed independent practices. Um, all of our overheads are up. All of our expenses are up. All of our personnel costs are up. It costs us more to retain and recruit people um, than ever before. We have to pay our staff more or we lose them to higher paying ent entities. Um, unfortunately, independent practices don't have the option of asking for a rate increase halfway through the year. In fact, we have the same uh, you know, stagnant reimbursement that we've had for several years now. Um, we have patients who are requiring more care because of pent up demand. We've had to cut back hours in places because of lack of staff or lack of providers. Um, we've adjusted our day-to-day -day, uh, um, operations. We have cross-trained people to um, 
you know, make up for staff shortages. We have put off projects or repairs or things that we could. We have parking lots that need to be paved that are not paved because we put them off because we couldn't afford it this year. Um, we've prioritized seeing patients and providing the best possible care to our Vermont patients despite all these troubling circumstances. The end result of any increased spending with the hospital, regardless of the reason, is an increase in health insurance premiums, which then falls back again on the business owners, on the independent practices who now cost more to, to provide health care for our staff, which increases our overhead, which again increases the chance that our independent practices will not be able to plan, remain financially viable. Um, we strongly encourage the Mountain Care Board to reject this rate increase and ask UVMMC to look for ways to reduce costs without impacting direct patient care. We know that it's not easy. We know that it is easier to get a mid-year rate increase than it is to make the substantial changes that need to be made to, to sort of trim around the edges, but we strongly encourage uh, that be the avenue that's taken. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rick. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? I saw that uh, Sam and Mike were on earlier from the Healthcare Advocate's office, and I just want to give you an opportunity. Um, if you had any questions for uh, UVM um, or any comments to uh, let us know now so that uh, we have everything that we could possibly need to make a decision by Friday morning. Sam or Mike, are you still on? Thanks, Chairman. Um, I'm actually not sure if, if Mike's still on, but Mike, feel free to chime in. Um, just, just to say, no, no questions at the moment. Um, I appreciate the conversation and the um, rigor with which the board is approaching this question, and also appreciate UVM Health Network for, um, you know, being so engaged in this process. I mean, I, I want to recognize that it's an incredibly challenging position to be in. Um, the HCA stands by our position. It's not a dogmatic one. It's a challenging um, dynamic, obviously, but we stand by the comments that we submitted and recommend that the board do not um, approve the charge request. Thank you, Sam. Is there any other public comment? Hearing none, is there any additional um, comments or questions from the board? If not, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Al. Um, Kim, I'm not sure if it's you or Joanne on Friday morning, um, but I assume that uh, Kara checked and we're all set on your end. Are you yes, there, Kim? We're all set. Yes, I am. We're all set for Friday. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> well, I'm all set for today then, correct? Yes, we're all set for today. Yep. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, for those who don't know, um, Kim and Joanne are retiring, and that has been a nightmare trying to find a replacement to um, do the transcription services here in the state of Vermont. So um, if anybody knows anybody that would like to start a small independent business here in the state of Vermont, I think it would be a great one to start. I don't have the fingers to do that, so it won't be me, but... <laughs> um, hopefully... Uh, um, someone will step into their shoes and in the meantime it looks like uh, the state will have to be uh, using uh, out-of-state firms for transcription um, after the Kim and Joanne retire. So with that Al we'll see you again at eight o'clock. Um, thank you, you again. It. Thank you. Good to see you Steve. So at this point, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Just to follow up on a conversation that we had, um, uh, I believe it was two weeks ago, but it might have just been last week um, about uh, wait times. Um, I did uh, officially appoint uh, Member Holmes and Member Walsh 
to be the two board members that will work with um, DFR, DIVA, and the Healthcare Advocates Office to try to come up with the right language um, for um, wait times. So other than that, I have nothing else. So is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. Second. It's been moved by Tom and seconded by Jess to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that uh, that motion was carried unanimously. Thank you, everyone. And uh, um, we'll be back on uh, the topic of UVM and CVMC Friday morning at 8 a.m. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.